Well, thank you for the invitation to speak at Mike's 60th birthday. Happy birthday, Mike. Um, I'm really glad to be able to participate, although albeit remotely. Um, I think I first met Mike in 1989 or 1990. So Nadi Zyberg and I took a drive up from the Institute to uh, visit uh, Steve Schenker and Mike Douglas in the uh, temporary uh, trailers that was where the NHATC was housed at the time. And I have a very clear memory of that. It was an amazing visit. Uh, Mike and Steve uh, explained to us how you could use matrix models to give a formulation of 2D gravity as we just heard in the previous talk. Um, and uh, that was just amazing work. And of course, Mike has gone on to do uh, a lot of really amazing and important work. And also I've had some really good collaborations with him. So thank you, Mike. Um, now, Mike's, Mike's interests are very, very broad. And uh, as, as is evidenced by the program of, of this uh, conference and um, all encompassing. And uh, Mike, I think we all agree is different for example, Mike was able to cross the horizon and, and then come back again. I, I didn't know you could do that. Um, so that means that he's in principle solved the black hole information paradox, although he's not allowed to tell us what the solution is. Um, so since Mike is, is really different, I thought I would give a really different um, kind of seminar from what I normally would give it a scientific conference. So I thought I would talk about the mathematics and theoretical physics of modern Western square dancing. Uh, this is something that I uh, enjoy doing with my wife, Karen Rabe, who's also a physicist. And so I thought I would tell you a little bit about it. Okay, why square dancing? Well, there is some fun underlying mathematics as I'll explain. It also involves some fun physical activity. So it gives new meaning to the term physical mathematics. <laughs> uh, it's also good for the aging brain. It involves agility, coordination, quick mental recall, concentration, music, teamwork, and social interaction, as I'll show you. And it's okay to be a square dancer and a physicist. So renowned physicists like like Ken Wilson and Enrico Fermi and even Sheldon Cooper were <laughs> enthous enthusiastic square dancers. Um, they were all enthusiastic square dancers. Okay, so what is square dancing? So I'm gonna do my best to convey the activity using some videos, but unlike ballet or ice dancing, square dancing is most definitely not a spectator sport. It's like physics and mathematics. You have to do it to understand it, but I'll give it a try anyway. So what is modern Western square dancing? So it's a, square, it's a dance form where there are, it starts out with four couples on the sides of a square as in this picture. And uh, in each couple, the dancer on the left is called the boy and the dancer on the right is called the girl. And it's important to say right up front that the uh, gender one identifies with in everyday life has nothing to do with your square dance gender. I, I, I like to dance the boy, uh, but we have to distinguish that so we call them boys and girls. The dance is led by a caller who issues commands. These commands are known as calls and the calls are code words or phrases for established sequences of dance moves. So the dancers dance the moves associated to a call as the caller delivers them. And importantly, the dancers don't know the sequence of calls ahead of time. They have to react and execute the calls in real time. The callers on the other hand might be following a pre-planned sequence of calls or might be improvising. So there are traditional calls that hearken back to some of the historical roots in folk dancing, including uh, in traditional French folk dancing. So that's where the terms like dos a dos, alamon left, and promenade come from. And then there are also descriptive calls, 
like all up to the middle and come on back and circle left. So imagine that you're in a square right now, you're on one of the sides and I said, you know, I was the caller and I said, um, all up to the middle and you come on back, join 16 hands, circle left, circle to the left, around you go. What well, you would know what to do, right? You don't need to take <laughs> lessons to know what to do uh, with those calls. On the other hand, there are colorful names for more elaborate sequences of moves like Ferris wheel, recycle, chain reaction, relay the juicy, tally ho, the list goes on and on of things where, well, you do have to get some instruction as to what these things mean. So uh, I thought I would show you a little bit of um, some video clips throughout the talk. And uh, here's a bit of a square dance. So dances are divided up into series of 15 minute sessions, which are called tips. And the tips uh, are themselves divided into two parts. The first is what's called a patter section, which focuses on the calls. And the second part is a singing call. And I'll come to singing calls later on. So uh, one thing to observe here, there's a lot of information uh, when you look at something like this. So what should you look for? Well, obviously there's more than one square on the floor. Okay, a square is eight dancers. There are a lot of squares on the floor here. Listen for the caller chanting the calls. Um, listen, try and listen out for what the calls are. And if the dancers are good dancers, they're executing the calls, stepping to the beat of the music. So here we go. Here's a little bit of uh, some very excellent square dance calling. Only good when they get back on side square. Three when they get me four. Four hands are around the girl when they get four. Right on up to the outside to a fair with a left and fair. Sweet when they come right in. Now do a double pass right to a run around and go to the left. You hitch, then walk and dodge and chase right. Come on, around the girl. Boy, right around the girl. Let them do around and do. Turn a girl around. Pass free when you've been here like it. Pass free with the wheel and lead and do. We set the square through. All right, so that was a little bit, um, and you'll see some. You'll see a lot more actually. So now, square dancers come from all walks of life, and if you go to a square dance, you're going to see a very different tranche of society from what you normally encounter in academic circles. But nevertheless, a disproportionate number of dancers and callers are tech types, computer scientists and engineers. And indeed the top college square dancing clubs are, what are they? Tech squares at MIT and the Stanford quads. And the reason for that is that square dancing has a mathematical character that really appeals to puzzle solvers. And that's what I'm gonna be describing mostly in this talk. So here's an overhead view of some pattern called at MIT's Tech Squares by a very brilliant caller named Ted Lazat. And so on the right, I've listed the calls that you're gonna hear in different colors so you can distinguish the calls. And again, there's a lot of information here. And what I recommend that you do is pretend you're the caller and you're trying to you know, keep track of where all the dancers are. I strongly recommend when watching this that you choose a dancer some dancer that stands out to you. It'll be different dancers for different people, but some dancer that stands out to you and just try and follow the motions of that one dancer. So here we go. Here's Ted Lazat. Bow to the partner. And the corner is two. Walk around your corner. Turn your partner up on the left. Head lady center for the teacup chain. Okay. Teacup chain is a long call. This is all teacup chain. Here comes another call. Hit square the Swing through. Another call. Boy run around the girl. Another call. Circulate. Chain down the line. Another call. Send her back with a Dixie style. Trade the wave. All eight circulate. Swing through here. Boy run around the girl. Bend the line. Load the boats. All right, that's a little bit of pattern. Uh, those are good dancers too. Uh, so what do we see here from a mathematical point of view? So each call is a transformation operator on a set 
of eight distinguishable oriented particles. <laughs> They're oriented because they have noses. Okay. Um, how do you understand this diagram? We've got an overhead view here of a square. As I, the boys are the dancers on the left and they are squares and the girls are the dancers on the right. They are the circles and the dots show the facing direction. And then off to the side here is collar. And so, you know, if we don't distinguish the dancers, then we have a, uh, a dihedral symmetry. Um, and indeed, all the operations in D4 can be implemented by calls, uh, but then some calls will transition the picture from uh, this square to a different, what's called a formation. So here again, let me show you head square through four. Okay, that's an animation of head square through four. The, the position of the caller, of course, breaks that symmetry and leads to the numbering scheme here uh, that you see here that uh, uniquely determines that. Um, technical term, the head couples are couples number one and three with either facing the caller or with backs to the callers. The side couples are numbers two and four. Those are the ones with the uh, shoulders to the caller. So now let's ask ourselves, how many dancer states are there? Well, to simplify matters a little bit, assuming very conservatively that the positions of the distinguishable dancers are always on a four by four grid, the number of dancer configurations is given by this formula, which is around two trillion, which is too much for any human dancer or caller to keep track of. The goal here is to keep the dancing um, possible uh, and interesting, but also possible. It should be challenging, it should be interesting, but it should also be possible. So what we use instead is something called symmetric calling, which only uses calls that leave a certain inversion symmetry through the flagpole center of the square un unbroken. The flagpole center is the geometric center of the square. There's a little flag for you. And um, the flagpole symmetry relates the antipodal points. So boys one and three are called flagpole opposites. Similarly, girls one and three are flagpole opposites and so on. And so with symmetric calling, the uh, flagpole relation of the four pairs of dancers is unbroken throughout the dance. So for example, in head square through four, this is the final point after head square through four. And you can check for yourself that boys one and three are antipodal points, girls one and three are antipodal points and so on. So uh, let's look a little more at, um, let's try and play a little bit of this and I'll try and skip through the uh, teacup chain so we could start with the head square through four. Here we go. Let's, okay. Here the girls are doing the teacup chain, which I said is a long call. Okay, here they're gonna be finishing up the teacup chain. Listen for the head square through four. Head square through four. Swing through. Whoa. Stop, we'll stop, around. stop. Okay. So there was the head square through four, and it made the transformation that you see on the right. Now, as they're completing the call, and as in this um, still photograph here, the caller issues another call, swing through. And here's an animation of the swing through. In this photograph, they're in the middle of the swing through. Uh, should I play that again? Maybe I should play that again. So here they go. That's a swing through. And that leads to the uh, final position that you see down there. As they finish the swing through, so then the caller calls boys run. There's the implementation of boys run. The photograph here shows it after they finish the boys run. As the dancers finish are just implementing the boys run, the caller calls couples circulate. That's that motion. As they're finishing the callers, the couples uh, circulate. We have chained down the line and that gives that configuration. Okay, so how do we specify a dancer state? Well, by definition, a formation is the positions and facing directions of indistinguishable dancers. So we've seen the squared set. So in this pictogram, the girls are not circles. I've just let, I've got indistinguishable dancers. So I'm not distinguishing between boys and girls in, this, in these pictograms. Then we actually saw after head square through four, an eight chain formation where we have two pairs of facing couples. 
Then there are these right-handed waves. You saw that briefly and right-handed two-faced lines and facing lines. We saw that at the end um, just a moment ago. So altogether, there are 80 recognized standard formations. So then we should try and simplify things a little bit by realizing that some dancer configurations are essentially the same. Any action of a rotation group by Z4 around the flagpole center gives us a torsor of essentially the same configuration. So if I have facing lines like this and I rotate by Z4, then I'll think of those as a kind of equivalence. Notice by the way that this is a very nice example of a torsor, right? There's no, there's no natural configuration that you would call the identity element of the group. Uh, on the other hand, if I have facing lines like this and facing lines like that, those are not equivalent. Why are they not equivalent? Because look at the configuration of the, um, just look at the, uh, for example, the sequence of boys uh, as you read the square counterclockwise. In the, on the left-hand side, you see boys one, two, three, four. On the right-hand side, you see boys one, four, three, two. Can't get one from the other by a, a, a rotation. There's another aspect here called relationships, which is a little more subtle, but I thought I'd try and explain it. So relative to any dancer, the four dancers of the opposite gender have special names. They're called partner, corner, opposite, right-hand lady or left-hand man. So for example, relative to the red boy, his partner is the girl, the red girl. And you might notice there are these little lines there with a dot in between them. That means that they're holding hands. So the boy is holding hands with his partner. The red boy is holding his hands with his partner, which is the red girl. His corner, naturally enough, is the at the corner of the square. That's the yellow girl. His opposite is the blue girl. His right-hand lady is the, is the green girl. Now, relative to the red girl, her partner is the red boy. Her corner is the green boy, her opposite is the blue boy, and her left-hand man is the yellow boy. So here's our first theorem. So we consider any contiguous set of four dancers in a dancer state obtained by symmetric calling, such that no two dancers in that set are flagpole opposites. Then first of all, that set contains exactly two boys and two girls. And I think you should be able to think about that and, and figure that out in real time. Uh, something that's more subtle is the following. One of the four mutually exclusive possibilities must hold. All the dancers in that, in that group of four have, all, have their partners somewhere in that group of four. All the dancers in that group have their corner somewhere in the group of four. All the dancers have their opposite in that group of four, or all the dancers in the group of four have their right-hand lady or left-hand man. So now here's how we specify dancer states. It's called a phaser. A phaser is a specification of the symmetric dancer locations up to rotation around the flagpole center. So F we already know, that's for formation. The arrangement is the sequence of boys and girls along say a side of the configuration. So here I have facing lines and notice as you look at the bottom line and what do you see? You see a boy, girl, boy, girl. But by calling, we could also make it girl, boy, girl, boy, or we could make it boy, boy, girl, girl, and so on. And so there are four choose two or six arrangements. Then there's sequence. That's the ordering of the boys and the girls around as you go around the square. Uh, convention is counterclockwise. So in this picture here, the boys are in the sequence, one, two, three, four. The only other possibility consistent with flagpole symmetry is one, four, three, two. And then there are two sequences for the girls. So there are four sequences. And relation, as I just showed you on the previous slide is from theorem one, any set of contiguous dancers without flagpole opposite has a partner corner opposite or right-hand lady exclusively in that group of four. So altogether the 96 phasers, 80 formations, that's 7,600 7, phasers, roughly. The dancer configurations form a Z4 bundle over the set of phasers, which by the way is trivialized by the position of the collar. So altogether there are around 30,000 dancer states, which is an improvement over 2 trillion. 
Now you might be thinking that we should be using group theory to think about this, uh, these uh, calls and the configurations of the dancers. That's almost right. But you can't quite interpret the calls as group transformations because some calls cannot be implemented from some configurations. So for example, here I have lines facing out. Well, I cannot call dosa do or pass through from here because in the definition of dosa do or pass through, the first thing you do is with the dancer in front of you, you pass right shoulders. That's the first thing you do. Well, there's no dancer to pass right shoulders with. So you can't implement the call. So clearly what we have here is a category. So we define the category square dance to be the category whose objects are dancer configurations. And notice there's a distinguished object, which is the squared set called home by square dance callers. And then the morphisms are generated by the calls. And only, you know, from a certain configuration of dancers, only some calls can be implemented. So the theorem is that between any two dancer states, uh, consistent with flagpole symmetry, there is a countably infinite number of morphisms. Now, people in the past, including myself, have, um, have said that this category is a groupoid. Um, but when thinking about it a little more carefully for this talk, I realized that that's actually quite wrong. Um, the identity morphism is where the dancers stand still. Um, any, uh, any other call will make some dancers move. They can't unmove, they can't undo what's been done. So morphisms are in fact never invertible. Of course you could formally invert them, but then that's not what the physical dancers are actually doing. So it's actually very far from being in a groupoid. Now elements of um, a, any morphism from a state, a dancer state S to the same dancer state S is called by square dance callers a zero. So for example, the famous call do -sa do is a zero. Let's just illustrate that. So there they go. And so you see the initial and final dancer configuration is exactly the same. So that's what they call a zero. And of course, zeros can be made by composing several calls. So let's illustrate that. Here, the dancers are a little slow here. They must be old. So that's pass through. And now they got to catch their breath and uh, partner trade and catch their breath. And now they got to do a right and left through. There they go. Okay. And so that's a composition of three calls giving me a zero. So uh, a sequence by definition is an element of HOM S naught S naught. S naught is the home squared set. Uh, which is the base point of this category. A pattern then, what you saw Mike Sikorsky doing or Ted Lazat doing is an element of HOM S naught S naught, which is a composition of several sequences. Of course, some sequences are a lot more fun and more elegant uh, than others and more interesting than others. And that's where the art of square dance calling comes in. Now for the improvising caller, Getting the dancers home again is actually quite a challenge. It's a lot like mate in three moves type of chess problem. There's a folk theorem out there that any dancer configuration, for any dancer configuration, there exists a chain of three calls to get them home. I'm not sure if that's true. I've heard people claim this. <laughs> for the dancers, getting home again is a real payoff. They celebrate because they've done the calls right. They've executed all the instructions just right in the right amount of time. So here I would show you a clip of a caller down in Galena. He's actually resolving his square to home. And I want, to, want you to note some things here. He's, he's improvising. Everybody's having a good time. And notice that the dancers have, give each other a big high five when they get home. They celebrate. They've done it right. Here we go. Spit the top. Spit the top. Long knots. Right and left through. Here we go. Real good. Star through. Side arch dive through. Square through. Three hands go. Set it up and on a and 
And there they are all high-fiving, okay? Because it is really a lot of fun when it all works nicely. Okay, there's actually a little connection to knot theory here. So, you know, there's more to, to, um, to this, this square dance business than just the, conf, you know, the configurations, the dancer states and the chains of morphisms from one state to another. The actual world lines of the dancers matters quite a lot, especially to the dancers, right? So um, let's see. So here's, here's, a, here's a call, heads partner trade. Here we go. It's a very simple thing. But what do you see there? What you see is an elementary braiding operation consistent with the flagpole symmetry. So this implements braiding of colored ribbons. And so the time evolution of eight oriented particle positions with the same initial and final formation, of course, forms a ribbon brand, ribbon braid. So here's all eight circulate. Let's, uh, here we go. All eight circulate. And I do that. And um, by the way, while I'm at it, here I can illustrate that theorem on relationship calling again. Here's an example. Uh, I, I have a full, I set of four contiguous dancers, uh, not related by flagpole symmetry. And you note that everybody in that group of four has their partner somewhere in that group of four. And in the final phaser here, um, everybody in that group of four contiguous dancers without flagpole opposites has their opposite dancer in, in that group of four. That illustrates theorem one. Here's the, uh, the ribbon uh, diagram the braid diagram again for all eight circulate. And uh, you might've heard right and left grand and notice the beautiful paths that they, uh, that they execute here. And that's right and left grand and just one more. Um, this is one of my favorite calls, relay the Ducey. So we have to, okay. That's the beginning of the call. And here they're going to do relay the Ducey. Everybody trades, center, center is cast three quarters, the ends Herculate a half, center six trade, and so on. And so, um, and then that's the end of the call. Again, look at the paths. When I was uh, explaining this to Vijay Balasubramanian uh, a couple of years ago, um, he remarked that, you know, these, these paths are very reminiscent of a, a very beautiful uh, art form. Uh, from India called Kolam and Rangoli. And it's, it's really nice to see that this common sense of uh, beauty extends across cultures. So anyway, let me remind you that elements of a uh, HOM SS for any S are known to square dance callers as zeros. And so any, to any zero, of course, we can associate an element of the pure braid group. So here again, with the paths illustrated is our friend Dosa Do. And now, so of course you can identify the initial and final dancer configurations, and that gives and that gives a link, and you can calculate its turn Simon Switten invariant, and that's an example of that's dosa do, that's that's the uh, link invariant for dosa do. Of course, it depends on how the what representations the dancers choose to be, but um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything interesting in, in computing link polynomials of uh, of square dance zeros, but there it is. It exists. All right, so another, another aspect of square dancing, quite an important one, is music. So as I mentioned before, dances are a series of 15-minute sessions called tips. And the first part is a patter section, which focuses on the calls, and that's what we've been talking about. And the second part is what's called a singing call. And here the caller actually sings a song, interspersing calls and lyrics. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a singing call. And what you should listen for here is that um, you should listen for the fact that he's singing lyrics and he's also singing calls in between. So he sings a call and the dancers are executing the call. And while they're executing the call, he lets sing some lyrics and then back and forth. Other thing you might wanna note is everyone's having a great time. And uh, here the dancers have dressed up in traditional square dance uh, regalia and very kindly, They've, they've got a color scheme. They've danced in matching colors. So you see the initial partners are, in dance, are, are matched up in the same colors. That, that's actually quite helpful. Um, so here's a little bit of a singing call. Sure 
Alabama, left that corner, do it outside no. Left Alabama, gonna weave that ring, let's go. On that road again, when I meet that lady, swing a little lady promenade. The life I love is making music with my friends, and I can't wait to get heads up to the middle and back and then side to square three. <laughs> We'll come back to that in a second. So many forms of music are, are used here. Um, there are blues, country, disco, folk, jazz, pop, rock, spirituals. I've probably left some things out. Um, some classical music, but not much. You really need a steady 2-2, two, 2-4, two, two, four, 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 or very rarely 6-8 time signature. So, for example, I do not think you can square dance to Chopin, Ravel, or Stravinsky. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> um, now, an important element of a singing call is a kind of transformation known as a corner progression, where we go from a square to the square, but um, the girls have progressed by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So notice that in this transformation here, girl one has moved 90 degrees over to be the new partner of boy two. She's gone uh, one quarter around the square. And of course, C to the fourth is a zero. So that's the basic idea behind the structure of a singing call, which is very rigid. There are seven verses of 64 beats. Verses one, four, and seven are sequences in hum as S. Verses two and three and five and six are corner progressions, at least 99% of the time. There are interesting ways of varying that, but um, that that's beyond beyond the scope of this talk. So um, the... the, the uh, the, the, the net consequence is that partners change as all around the square. Everybody gets to dance with, um, with somebody else uh, during, during the course of the singing call. Uh, of course, C to the fourth, as I said, is hum S naught S naught. So there's a huge satisfaction in getting your original partner back to dance the last verse. I should also mention that calls take a specified number of beats. So say head square through four is 10 beats. And so designing a singing call uh, is quite tricky because you have to fit in. This has to fit with the music. It has to fit with the lyrics and it all has to fit together in 64 beats. The so people are back home. It's not a trivial thing at all. Okay, so here again is, a, uh, is, is that singing call that we were watching before, but I'm gonna play, now I'm gonna play the first two verses out of seven. And at the first, at the end of verse one, you're gonna notice that the boy is back with his partner and you can tell that easily because of the color coding. And then try and note that at the end of verse two, the boys are going home with their previous corner as their new partner. And, and here at the bottom right of the, of the slide, you can see the ending configuration at the end of verse two. So you see that the pink lady is now with the black boy, with a purple and black boy. Okay, so here, let's watch first two verses of this. <coughs> Sterling on that rodeo. Just can't wait to get on that rodeo. Do it on the band, left that corner. Do it outside the Left down the band, they're gonna weed that ring, let's go. On that rodeo. With a meat that they swing a little lady promenade. That's the end of verse one. Here's verse two. Now here's the uh, verse two is finishing up here. And now let me stop this in time. There we go. Okay. So that's the end of verse two. And so it goes. I, in fact, I'm going to show you one more. This is going to be verses three and four from uh, another singing call. And what to look for. So you should look for the corner progression. But, and so, so focus on one girl. And I strongly recommend you focus on the lady in the silver dress. That's the easiest one to follow. And I also wanna show this because it's a really excellent performer performance by uh, the caller, Deborah Carol Jones. 
And the other thing you might notice is that everyone's having a great time. So in verse three, we're going to have a corner progression. In verse four, they're just going to get home, but you're actually going to, it's going to pan over to Deborah uh, doing her, her uh, performance. Heads from an And okay, so let's get back to the puzzle solving aspect of this. Um, so you can have a lot of fun with at an introductory dance with just you know a few calls, 10 or fewer calls, you can have a great, great time. But the mathematical thinkers who have been attracted to square dancing have developed square dance calls and concepts that emphasize the puzzle solving aspect. And so consequently, there are different dance, what are called programs. These are not computer programs. These are lists of calls that are legal, that you can legally call to a group of dancers um, that range from pure social dancing to the mathematical extreme. And I like to think of it as the different colors of belts in karate. So there's a, an association of square dance callers called Caller Lab which has standardized these programs and standardized the definitions of the calls. And so the basic program is what people start with. It's the uh, 50 calls. And you can have a fantastic time with a dance for 50, using those 50 calls. Some, for many people, that's not enough. So they have the mainstream call, a program where you add an additional 18 calls and everything is cumulative, of course. A mainstream dancer knows how to dance the basic program. So that leads to 68 the plus program makes uh, 32 more to 100 calls. And then many people are dancing these calls just from money, muscle memory. But in fact, as I'll talk about a little more in a moment, the, 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 the calls have very precise definitions. And so there's called dancing by definition means you have to know those definitions really well because they can be they can be called from unfamiliar uh, configurations, unfamiliar situations, and you have to be able to react in real time. So that requires quite quick and clear thinking. Then there's the advanced program with another 70 calls. And then what sort of the black belt of square dancing is the challenge program, which itself is broken up into several uh, levels, C1, C2, C3, and so on. And so if you get all the way to C4, not many people do, if you go get all the way to C4, that's an additional over a thousand calls that you need to know. And this is still dancing, but it's very much puzzle solving in motion. So square dancing has a strong computer science feel to it. Many callers are in fact computer scientists. And as I said, the, the definitions of the calls are very precise. They make use of previous calls. So for example, pass the ocean by definition is three parts, pass through, face your current partner, step to a right hand ocean wave. And a caller can do something like do the last two thirds of past the ocean and you've got to process fast. Uh, what, are the, what are the definition of past the ocean? Then new calls can made, be made from old by insertion, deletion, substitution. And in fact, insert, delete and substitute are actually challenge calls. So here's an example. Here's an example of uh, that kind of very high level programming um, uh, calling. Um, and the th one thing to look out for here that's kind of fun is when the dancers are starting to have too much fun and starting to whoop it up, uh, the caller actually shushes them <laughs> because they should be they should be concentrating on the puzzle solving. So, <laughs> voice distorted single file Dixie style or checker box mirror recoil. <laughs> Oh, 
follow through the boys' old truck down the circulator. Three quarter minutes. <laughs> How many of you got to go? Rock, poke, eat, two, to get back there. Oh, by the way, here's an example. I said that uh, biological gender has nothing to do with square dancing gender, and you can see that illustrated here. Um, of course, people do make mistakes. So error detection and correction is an important part of square dancing and square dance calling. So the detection, well, you can detect errors in many ways. Uh, typically, the flagpole symmetry will be broken. I mean, in extreme cases, you'll have a line with five dancers on one side and three on the other, um, or partners might not be home at the end of a sequence. And then there's the issue of correction. And you want to correct things in real time so that people keep moving and, have, and are having fun. Now, you know, there are easy cases, like one dancer is wrong and turned around the wrong way. And that's like an error correcting code. Then it's easy to, you know, fig figure out what to do with the wrong one wrong dancer. Um, here's, I mentioned teamwork at the very beginning, and there really is a huge amount of teamwork going on here. Uh, dancers give visual clues, verbal clues, and so on to keep, keep everybody um, in the right place at the right time. There can also be helper words from the callers, but there are times when there's a total breakdown and we just say square your sets and everybody gets back home and we, we, we start again. And of course the caller will make mistakes too. Now, you know, if, if squares are not enough for you, you can also do square dance calling from hexagons and rectangles. So from uh, rectangles, the same calls work. And this is actually an extremely good thing to do when there are four mod eight dancers who want to dance. So here is, uh, here's a rectangle um, and here's head square through four uh, illustrated from a rectangle. Here they go. Okay, those, those, uh, those dancers have had a lot of coffee. They were going really fast. So, um, and then hexagons, much more surprisingly, the same calls work uh, for hexagons, although the calling and dancing is considerably more challenging. So here's a hexagon configuration. Again, notice the beautiful paths that they're going to trace out. And here's, the, uh, here's head square through, but in a hexagon. And there they do, that's it. Um, okay, so that's all I'm really gonna say about square dancing in case you're interested in giving it a try. I thought I'd say a few words at the very end here about the uh, square dance community. Um, prerequisites, what are the prerequisites to be able to square dance? Uh, you do have to be able to move to a beat between 124 and 132 beats per minute. Uh, you have to be able to distinguish left from right. Uh, and you have to have some intelligence and the more the better. Um, the square dance community consists primarily of square dancing clubs. So these are our local clubs that typically dance two to two and a half hours, either every week or every two weeks, something like that. They typically sponsor square dance lessons. My experience has been that they are extremely welcoming and inclusive of all people from all walks of life. Uh, anybody can dance boy or girl, as I've mentioned, and the dress is typically casual, but some people enjoy dressing up. And you saw examples of both of those kinds of things in, in the clips. Uh, for those who can't get enough, uh, there are festivals and conventions where you can go and you can dance from morning till late at night uh, for a whole weekend or uh, even more. Um, one of the things I really like about square dancing is it's a very international activity. So square dancing is popular in Australia, Austria, Canada, the Czech Republic, England, Germany, Japan, Switzerland, Sweden, and I've surely left out some places. Um, the lyrics and the side comments are in the local language. So if the caller has to say, Joe, turn around, that's gonna be in the local language. But the calls are in English and are standardized worldwide. So it's like square dancing is just another language. And as, you know, as it happens, the, the, the calls have been written out in English and people who don't speak a word of English, but our square dancers still know these kinds of uh, calls and know what they mean. 
because they mean the same thing everywhere around the globe. So just to illustrate that, here's a clip from a, uh, a dance in Germany. Um, the caller is Thorsten Geppert. He's singing, a, he's doing a singing call here. And it's a very popular German tune known as Villenlos. So what to notice in this, in, this, in this clip here? The lyrics are in German. The calls are in English. So listen out for that. And you might also note that everyone's having a good time. And in fact, the, the whole floor, the whole square dancing floor is singing along in German with the, the, the chorus of the song. Uh, oh, ich war wirklich nicht in der Lage, nicht aus, aus, auf dem Weg. Vega zu gehen. Okay, here we go. All right, so at least before the pandemic, you could just show up at a club anywhere in the world. Of course, it's polite to let them know ahead of time, but you can just show up at a club anywhere around the world and you're welcome to dance. And uh, so for example, in, in back in 2018, Karen and I were in, uh, in Japan and uh, we went to uh, the Chiyoda Square Dance Club. And you see here, they're, they're very formal. They've taken this very formal photograph with us and uh, everyone's dressed very nicely and so on. Um, and they're very ex excellent dancers, by the way, very precise, perfect, uh, good dancers. And then the same weekend, we, had, we also danced at a very informal club. This, is, this was a square dance taking place in a bar. So, um, you know, there's a whole spectrum here. Uh, of course, the pandemic, uh, put live square dancing on hold, at least during the worst phases of the pandemic, at least for those who believed in the pandemic. Um, but the uh, square, square dancers and callers actually found a workaround, which is to use Zoom and have the dancers, which are of course now solo people or single couples that are isolating at home. So they imagine the positions of the other seven or six phantom dancers. Uh, as you can imagine, that requires a good imagination. Um, but there is now a small international community of Zoom dancers. And you can Zoom, uh, you know, you get dancers from Australia and England and, and Canada, all over, the, all over the place, in Japan also. So actually, here's a, um, here's a Zoom shot of uh, Karen and myself actually calling a Zoom dance. And we have, um, we have dancers from Germany and England and, and all over the United States on this. So uh, Karen and I worked out these mathematical connections for ourselves, but for, the, for this talk, I thought I would hunt around on the internet a little bit for what, what's out there about mathematics and, and square dancing. And there is some stuff, not a lot. This is all I could find. This is like the total literature on mathematics and square dancing that's out there. Um, there's even a math overflow content, <laughs> and, um, and uh, I, I do really recommend, if you're interested in this, I, 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 re I highly recommend a, a nice talk by Guy Steele, who's a well-known computer scientist. Um, I think he works at Oracle. Uh, uh, and he, his talk is the musical and mathematical design of square dance singing calls, which I just alluded to very briefly. And that's a lecture at MIT. Uh, which is available on the internet. And if anybody out there actually knows of other, other discussions, other material, please let me know. So thanks for your attention. And uh, Mike, uh, happy birthday. And uh, uh, looking forward to interacting with you in uh, scientifically in the future and uh, maybe even as your flagpole opposite. So thank you. Thank you, Greg, for the instructive uh, talk. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Greg. That, 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 that was really great. That was fun.
Uh, when, uh, when Greg proposed to give this uh, talk, I was actually not sure whether he, he, he one could fill 50 minutes with uh, a talk <laughs> on this topic, but he definitely did it. Uh, you know, that was uh, that was quite something. Uh, I was I was going to ask. Uh, I mean, your, your your folk theorem. I'm sure people have solved that. It's, it seems pretty trivial that, that you can come back to the to the home from with, with at most uh, three moves. So. Let me uh, ask another mathematical question for you, which is, uh, is there a uh, pattern, I guess a sequence, which uh, produces the unknot? Uh, uh, yeah, um, well, I mean, you'll have to have several components because there are several dancers. Yeah. Well. But um, if I do a U-turn back twice, um, Yeah, I mean, I could, yeah, uh, heads, yeah, if I'm in lines and I just do uh, heads forward and back, uh, that's pretty much the unknot, right? That's, uh, that's going to be eight, eight components of the unknot. Yeah, so, yeah, so, in fact, um, I even illustrated that. So, heads, all up to the middle and you come on back. Okay, so what do they do? They're, 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 it's a degenerate unknot, but they, they, they go up and then they come back and then that's, that's uh, eight, eight unknots, yeah. Right, right, so, so is there a more interesting unknot, I guess? Uh, than, than uh, more interesting you one. Know, well, you don't have to come up with oh, I see, you want, them, uh, you want, you want it to be not <laughs> obviously a knot, sort of like, like, the, like the typical the projection of a knot where there's lots of crossings. But yeah, in fact, yeah. it's the unknot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, Mike, I, I don't, I don't think. I mean, you know, uh, the the folk theorem. I, I'm well. One thing is, I'm sure nobody's proved it because nobody before this lecture has sort of formulated it. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very natural question. I mean, in the, in the terms that, you, I, that before, I formulated. Before you asked it, you know, because any, any group of, you know, like solving a Rubik's cube or something. You know, that, that um, that's right, that's right. So, I mean, actually in, 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 in actually, you know, in calling a dance, um, you, you, you do sometimes want to get them home as fast as possible, right? Wow. So you do want to kind of find the, the minimal path of, of calls um, that that will do it, and but that that there's a lot of non-trivial aspects of this because uh, oh, but, but the technology to do it is relative to find out relatively easily is there. So if it's really true that nobody has worked this out, oh, I'm, I'm sure a computer scientist that was determined yeah. would would you know write a program, explore yeah. all the uh, dancer states, and 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 try the different morphisms and see if the minimum is three. Yeah. yeah. That kind of proof, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that uh, it could be it could be verified or refuted by that kind of theorem, by that kind of approach. Yes. Uh, but actually, by the way, I mean actually seeing that path in real time, yeah. uh, <laughs> it could be very very difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, again, part of the art here is to do something which is uh, a little, you know you know, actually does apply, it's legal, the rules apply, but, um, uh, but it's not kind of the same old, same old uh, moves that everybody does. And then there are actually further, further things to take into account now, you know, the dancers are moving, so you don't want to have them moving forward fast and then issue a call that requires a, a sudden reversal of body flow. Uh, that's terrible. The dance, you know, that's really bad for the dancers, right? They, I mean, it's legal. It satisfies the mathematical rules of the composition, but it would be terrible choreography. And similarly, the things like hand availability. If a, if a call requires a left hand or a right hand to be, be used, and then the next call also requires the same hand, um, but that hand is not available because they've just used it. So there are a lot, there's actually quite a lot more to it. So.
do you think that one can show the, this moves to a neural network and quantify what is a good choreography and what's bad? <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah, um, that's a really nice question, Nikita, because because um, uh, I, I don't I don't know. It, it would be actually nice to do that because. Um, you know, you 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 can you can you can dance to a caller, and you can either love the choreography, and you know some callers are very creative, and it's just fun to dance, and it moves smoothly. But then there's some interesting elements, so it's it's not boring. Um, and then you can get you know something just off scale awful <laughs> you know where, where it's just totally obvious what they're going to call next and and the body flow isn't good so there's there's a huge aesthetic aspect to this of course um and and it would be very interesting to try and understand what that is more scientifically i i i think that's a nice question i don't think anyone's tried to do that but uh yeah that that would be interesting Greg. Uh, it's Volodya. Uh, oh, Volodya, hi. To construct a, hi. <laughs> I propose to construct a matrix model. <laughs> <laughs> each, each finger is a matrix of different color. Then it ha the, uh, he has two hands, two indices, <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so on. <laughs> well, it's just, um, it's just passing the category of, of square hands. You can count. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Elijah, if anybody could make a matrix model, <laughs> and it's glass, it's glass, by the way, you are on the floor. I know, I know. You, 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 Ivan, Ivan does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you can consider the limits. So actually, so more serious question. There's a notion in, in the business of DJing, which is called magic. So when you take two tracks and try to combine them smoothly, so two musical tracks, and then do kind of some kind of a spline, or something splice them together, or, or smooth the transition from one kind of music to another kind of music. Uh, so is there some you know, merging of, of different, uh, I forgot what it's called, sequence of calls, which makes the new? Uh, I, again, an excellent, an excellent question. So um, there are things called flow modules which are sort of um, sequences of calls that fit very well together. So, and a, so a flow module ends up being a, a chain of calls, but a particular, a particular chain of, of motions that actually works very nicely. And, um, and what callers are, are doing is they know these flow modules and they're sort of stringing these flow modules together very much like what you just said. Um, and, but something that I've observed um, from interacting with caller coaches is that people have not given much, much thought to what you just, I mean, good callers just know all this stuff intuitively. And you know, they would never think of any of this in the terms that, that we're talking about, but um, they just know it um, for, intuitively, but, 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 you know, more scientifically, you have these flow modules and some flow modules connect well to each other. And some flow modules are really terrible. I mean, you know, there, again, it's, it's, it's this issue of it's being, it's legal. You could, you could connect flow module A to flow module B and the dancers are in the right place and they can do it, but it just feels bad. Um, so, so yes, there is, there is again an aspect of that, that these, these flow modules that, that you memorize. Um, so, uh, you, know, uh, you know, for example, you know, head, head, uh, heads to the right and left through, half sachet slide through is equivalent to a head square through four. Um, but, uh, you know, what I do after that, what module I would use after that, um, you know, it depends a lot. Some, some would be good and some would be bad. For example, for example, you see, you could, get, um, you could get a dancer, you could do a perfectly legal um, concatenation of, of, of flow modules, but you would have the, just imagine head boy number one, sort of, 
you know, spinning around in, in his little corner of the square, right? <laughs> you know, he, maybe he does an L a man left and a turn apart in the right, but he never gets out of that real estate. He's always in the Southwest of the square <coughs> and never, never gets to, uh, you know, explore any other of the, of the, uh, the real estate of the square. Well, that's bad calling. Okay. It's, it's legal, but it's very bad calling. So that's an example where you could chain, you know, you could chain together these flow modules, but it, it, it would not be good choreography. <laughs>